Brought to you by NRDC and the ADM. You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on this show, Words on Film, about movies or otherwise, are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, let me get into my usual starting segment. Well, but first I got to let you know that I'm going to be reviewing four films for this show. And one of the films I'm going to be reviewing is the very eagerly anticipated Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. First though, what's topping the box office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And a lot pretty much remains the same as last week, at least when it comes to the top three. So, the number one movie at the box office two weeks ago was Coco. The number one movie at the box office last week, Coco. Number one movie at the box office this week, Justice League. No, I'm just kidding. It's Coco. (laughs) Which made a decent $18.5 million. But, against a budget that is approximately $175 to $200 million, Coco has so far made, at the U.S. box office, $135.7 $135.7 million. Around the world, it has so far made $390 million. So, while Coco is not a hit yet here at the U.S. box office, I hope it becomes a hit because it deserves it. It is a great movie and probably one of one of my top five favorite films of the year. And I'm just compiling that list, even though I've got a couple of shows left before the end of the year. But anyway... Here in the States, Coco is not a hit yet, but around the world, it is a tentative hit and is coming very, very close to being a certified hit and should be a certified hit worldwide by next week. We'll have to see. Number two at the box office is Justice League, which was number one at the box office last week and the week before that. It grossed $9.7 million, which is pretty decent, against a budget of $300 million in just... Four weeks, Justice League has made $212.1 million at the U.S. box office, and around the world it has made $614.7 million. So, Justice League is not a hit yet here in the States, but it might be by the end of the year. We'll have to see. But around the world, it is a certified hit, so good for Justice League. Wonder... Number three at the box office this week, number three at the box office last week, and number three at the box office the week before that. And no, I am not making that up. But this week it earned $8.4 million. Against a budget of $20 million, Wonder has so far made $100.3 million at the U.S. box office, and around the world it has made $129.6 million. So it's not working with nearly as big a budget as Coco or Justice League or Thor Ragnarok, which is going to be on this list a little bit later, but it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, probably thanks in large part due to its minuscule budget. So, Disaster Artist is the one of the newest entries to this list, but it's actually been out for two weeks, not one. And the Disaster Artist actually expanded its run into theaters everywhere, basically, having grossed $6.4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a surprisingly low budget of $10 million, though, the Disaster Artist has made, so far, in the United States... $8 million even. Around the world, it has made $9.7 million. So it's not a hit yet, but considering that it peaked at number four at the U.S. box office and probably is not going to leave the top ten next week, it's off to an incredibly good start. As a matter of fact, I would not be surprised if it becomes a certified hit here in the States and vicariously around the world by next week, but we'll have to see. Thor Ragnarok. I'm just going to come right out of the gate and say this. It's a certified hit around the world, tentative hit here in the States. But it's number five at the box office, sliding slightly from number four last week, having grossed $6.3 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $180 million, Thor Ragnarok has so far made $301.1 million here in the States and a staggering $833.7 million. So, moving on. 
Daddy's Home 2 was number 5 at the box office last week. This week it's number 6 at the box office, having grossed $5.9 million just in time for the holidays. Against a budget of $69 million, Daddy's Home 2 has so far made $91.1 million here in the States and $142.4 million around the world, which means that it's a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is also a certified hit. So good for that movie. Murder on the Orient Express is number seven at the box office this weekend, having grossed $5.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $55 million, Murder on the Orient Express has so far made $92.8 million here in the States in its five weeks in theaters, and a staggering $274.7 million worldwide. So it is a tentative hit here in the States, and it actually grows slightly more than Daddy's Home 2, which is kind of surprising if you think about it. But around the world, it is a certified hit like a freight train. Pun definitely intended. The Star is still doing well comparatively at the U.S. box office leading into Christmas because it is a Christmas movie, albeit a polarizing one. But the star grossed $3.7 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of just $20 million, that's $20 million, the star has so far grossed $32.3 million at the U.S. box office and $41.7 million dollars worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, and around the world, it is already a certified hit. So very good for the star, the Jim Henson Company, and everyone else behind that movie. Lady Bird is, has been at the box office for six weeks, but it's only been in the top ten for two weeks, but it's getting a lot of Oscar buzz. It's number nine at the box office this weekend, sl- sliding slightly from number eight last week having grossed $3.5 million. But against a budget of $10 million, Lady Bird has so far grossed $22.2 million at the U.S. box office. I don't have the international numbers for you, but I can tell you that Lady Bird already is a certified hit here in the States and vicariously is a certified hit worldwide. And finally, just getting started, the highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's not saying much, having grossed $3.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend against a budget of $22 million, so this movie looks like a bomb. And that's really not too soon. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with this person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive. And now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV, or one of the Community Access TV stations that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you very much. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is the latest movie from director and writer Woody Allen. The movie is called Wonder Wheel, and it takes place on Coney Island in Brooklyn in the 1950s, and a lifeguard tells the story of a middle-aged carousel operator and his beleaguered wife. Now, that is the description of the movie in a nutshell. Very much like most Woody Allen movies, particularly ones that Woody Allen writes himself, the premise is very original. Unfortunately, it's not particularly well executed. And I do have to say, in terms of prejudices, because I do have them being a critic, 
I was not particularly pleased that Justin Timberlake was cast in this movie. I think he has done relatively well in some movies he's been in, most notably The Social Network. But then there have been other movies like The Love Guru, Shrek the Third, Runner Runner, that in which he has underperformed. And those are just only a few of them. I do have to say, however, that <clears throat> even though I think an actor like James Franco or Joseph Gordon-Levitt or Ben Foster probably would have been better in the lifeguard role. Justin Timberlake did okay in this film, but he was not the weakness of this film. Instead, this is a film that lacks focus when it comes to storytelling. It certainly has some great characters in the movie, and Justin Timberlake's character is one that could be interesting, but unfortunately, the movie and Woody Allen as a director really loses focus on particular characters. There are some that might have interesting stories, but then he almost jump cuts to another character and a story that doesn't seem quite as interesting. Case in point. Juno Temple plays a woman named Carolina who comes to Coney Island uh, from where I, I can't ex exactly remember. But anyway, she is in search of her father, whose name is Humpty, who's played by or nickname is Humpty, who's played by Jim Belushi. And Carolina's backstory is she got married very young at the age of 20, which was still kind of young even for 1950s standards, and she married a gangster or somebody in the mafia. And after years of spousal abuse, she leaves her husband behind his back and goes to her estranged father, who basically disowned her ever since she got married at the age of 20. So her father, Humpty, again, Jim Belushi's character, is a carousel operator, and, she's, and he's married to his second wife, Ginny, who's played in this movie by Kate Winslet. Now, Ginny is a woman who is 39 years old and almost 40. In fact, she celebrates her 40th birthday in this movie. And she also has a son from a previous marriage by the name of Richie, who's played by a very young actor named Jack Gore. So, Ginny has a lot of problems. Number one, she's not exactly in love or in a loving relationship with Humpty. And number two, she also has migraines, and it doesn't help very much that they live on Coney Island with, yes, a great view of the Wonder Wheel, which is a... a um, Amer a carousel. No. Um, I, well, anyway, it's a, it's a Ferris wheel. That's it. A Ferris wheel that is probably still at Coney Island to this day. But uh, unfortunately, with the noise that Coney Islanders make, particularly with the, the carnival music and the tourists all added together, probably don't make... A, a lot of uh, good reason to live at Coney Island. Again, Coney Island is one of those places. It's probably a great place to visit, I would imagine, but I, even though I haven't been there, but you probably wouldn't want to live there. And Ginny also gets migraines, and the, the, the noise that comes from Coney Island doesn't help very much. There are also some interesting, albeit not particularly well-gelled <laughs> subplots, excuse me, that was the computer, that that really don't go anywhere. For instance, Ginny's son Richie is a pyromaniac, and it's kind of amusing to see him torch various things, but ultimately that doesn't go anywhere. And there's a lot of focus on Ginny's affair with the lifeguard Mickey, who's played by Justin Timberlake. And as I was watching it, I was really less interested in the affair. I'm not sure if it's because Juno Temple's character, Carolina, had a more interesting backstory, or if it was because Justin Timberlake's character was not as fleshed out as it could have been. Again, I usually do have a problem with Justin Timberlake's acting. I don't think he's a particularly great actor, but I think he did well with what he was given, but unfortunately he wasn't given very much. I do have to say, I did like Kate Winslet's character, and I think the film focused on her relatively well, but the, fo the, the focus was too much on both her affair with Justin Timberlake's character and also the love triangle that ensued with... Justin Timberlake's character, Kate Winslet's character, and Juno Temple's character. 
I wasn't really interested in the love story. And I also thought that this film, probably more than any other Woody Allen film, cut corners in terms of storytelling. I don't have a lot of time to get into what corners the film cut, but trust me when I say that there's a lot in this film that is told by the characters, but not so much that's shown. And sometimes things that are left out or left unshown or unsaid can be interesting. In fact, there's one scene involving Carolina's fate, which I won't give away. But overall, this is one of Woody Allen's disappointing movies, which is really unfortunate because the cinematography and the way 1950s Coney Island looks in this movie is beautiful. It's certainly tinged with nostalgia, but I love the way the Wonder Wheel worked. I loved Kate Winslet's performance. I also would have liked Juno Temple's performance a lot more if the film had focused on her character more, which I think it deserved. I can't say I hate the movie, but it gets my rating of a low checkout. I do think it's worth checking out for the sharp dialogue and Kate Winslet's performance, not to mention the beautiful cinematography, but Woody Allen has done better, even in his later years, and unfortunately, this is a disappointment, and I do think that he should have spent more time Hi, in the drawing I board. I found a toy dinosaur over on the playground by Smith Street. Uh, it had this phone number on it, and, well, I just wanted to make sure the dinosaur made it back to its little owner. When I found the little sippy cup, I just had to give you a call. It's for a kid, you know? I know my son gets super attached to the smallest things, even a fire truck, and I'd be happy to drop it off. We'd do anything for kids, yet one in six children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on bostonfreeradio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Just Getting Started. This is the latest from stars Morgan Freeman and Tommy Lee Jones, and it's written and directed by Ron Shelton. And Ron Shelton might not sound familiar to many of you, but he has directed such films as Bull Durham, which he also wrote, and for which he was actually nominated for an Oscar for Best uh, Writing, actually Best Original Screenplay in 1989. He was nominated, but he unfortunately didn't win. He also wrote and directed The um, White Men Can't Jump, Tin Cup, and Hollywood Homicide. So, a number of films that are relatively modern classics. But, a little bit of a spoiler alert, Just Getting Started will not be considered a classic. And I wanted to like this film based on the fact that Morgan Freeman stars in it, and Tommy Lee Jones and Rene Russo, both of whom I like very much as actors, also star in it. And I've reviewed bad movies that either starred or co-starred Morgan Freeman, and usually I said... As much high regard as I have for Morgan Freeman as an actor, I've always said, and this is especially the case with last year's unnecessary remake of Ben-Hur, it's bad, but it's not bad because of Morgan Freeman. Well, I can't say the same here, but admittedly, even though Morgan Freeman is bad in this movie, it's not just because of him that this movie is bad. So what is Just Getting Started about? It is a two-hander action comedy in the vein of Midnight Run, which, as you might remember, is a 1988 comedy starring Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin and is directed by Martin Brest. But this movie is about an ex-FBI agent who's played by Tommy Lee Jones and an ex-mob lawyer in the Witness Protection Program, played by Morgan Freeman, having to put aside their petty rivalry on the golf course to fend off a mob hit. Now, if that plot premise sounds intriguing to you is because it is an intriguing premise. Unfortunately, it takes a very long time for this premise to get going. I literally think that this movie, you don't find out that Morgan Freeman's character is an ex-mob lawyer who is in the witness protection program until literally about an hour into this one and a half hour film. Until up to this point, We just get a sense of Morgan Freeman's character, whose name is Duke, and he is the head of this luxurious Palm Springs estate 
that is home to several elderly people. Although the the residents of this Palm Spring estate include actors like or characters played by actors like Cheryl Lee Ralph, George Wallace, and um, Joe Pantoliano, who are in their 50s, but I wouldn't have exactly passed them for senior citizens, or at least they don't look that old. But either way, Duke, unfortunately, engages in very questionable business practices that bring the attention of one of the one of the employees of the company that owns this this resort whose name is Susie and she's played by Renee Russo and Renee Russo who still looks very good for her well for any age but let alone for 63 which is the age she is right now sorry Renee there's a certain tension between Morgan Freeman and Rene Russo, which I thought was might have been good for the story if the initial premise of the ex-FBI agent and the ex-mob lawyer who's in the witness protection program would have just gone on. So anyway, the ex-FBI agent was played by Tommy Lee Jones, and we're introduced to him as being a new resident in this Palm Springs Resort, and he starts up a rivalry with Morgan Freeman's character. They have this penis measuring contest, figuratively speaking, where Tommy Lee Jones beats Morgan Freeman at high-stakes poker and then beats him at golf tournaments. So eventually they have this petty rivalry going on that resembles basically something you'd see in a high school movie or even in real-life high school. In the meantime... There is a character by the name of Delilah, who's played by Jane Seymour, who figuratively and literally phones her part in. She's the one who recognizes Morgan Freeman's character from an ad that is aired on TV for this Palm Springs retirement community. And she basically spends the movie on the phone calling a relative of hers, I guess who went to jail because of Morgan Freeman's character, and tries to have Morgan Freeman killed. So, again, this might be intriguing, but the fact the fact that they have Jane Seymour just in a room on the phone shows that this part of the movie was just tacked on, and it sticks out like a sore thumb for lack of a better term. So, Morgan Freeman doesn't work in this movie because of the role he's given. He, he basically plays a playboy, and also somebody who is not particularly intelligent or thinks more with his emotions than with reason. And I I think that there are comic possibilities for another actor to play this kind of role. And while I credit Morgan Freeman with stepping out of his comfort zone, in other words, playing the wise old man in a number of movies, which he could probably play until his very day, This role just did not work for him. And also, the chemistry between him and Tommy Lee Jones is not there. And I'm not sure which actor's fault that is. So, this movie had a lot of promise in terms of its premise. But once the premise gets going, literally an hour into the film, it resolves too quickly. It doesn't resolve well enough. And this movie feels a lot longer than its hour and a half running time. It's really unfortunate. I thought it would be at least a little bit funny, but I do need but I do think that Morgan Freeman is doing too many of these let's give it one more go or let's do it for old time's sake roles that he's done one other before this year. I can't think of the name of it right now, but it co-starred Michael Caine and Alan Arkin. But it's just that Morgan Freeman is does not need to do these movies. I mean, it's it's great that he's doing other movies like the Dark Knight trilogy, but he doesn't need to do these schlocky comedies. So, as much as I like Morgan Freeman and Tommy Lee Jones, just getting started, while it's a beautiful looking movie, is a flunk out because it's full of way too many cliches, a plot that doesn't get going soon enough, and a miscast Morgan Freeman.
I'm a retired school psychologist and helping people was my thing. After my stroke, when Meals on Wheels started, I was on the other end of the stick, so to speak. My name is Julius Gaines, creative writer, poet, photographer. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Christmas Prince. And no, I am not kidding. I actually saw this movie. The reason I saw it is because it's on Netflix and I'm a Netflix subscriber. But the other reason is because Netflix tweeted something a couple of days ago. It said the following. This is what they tweeted on December... Uh, well, a couple of days ago, it is, they said, and I quote, to the 53 people who've watched A Christmas Prince every day for the past 18 days, who hurt you? End quote. I thought that was a hilarious tweet, but what I also found strange was that Netflix is putting out a movie that could easily fit into the Lifetime or Hallmark channels, and they don't need to do this. And A Christmas Prince, by the way, is not only a film that Netflix is showing, it is a Netflix original, meaning that Lifetime or Hallmark could have picked this film up, but Netflix chose to do it instead. And I'm I'm wondering why Netflix chose this original movie. It's sort of like when HBO does children's shows, you know? HBO has done a number of noteworthy children's shows. They aired Fraggle Rock, Happily Ever After, and they air actually the newer episodes of Sesame Street now before they reach PBS. But I've always wondered why HBO even bothered with children's programming. It's not as if removing that programming will hurt ratings, and HBO is known for its very, very adult content and for shows like... Oz, The Sopranos, The Wire, which are absolutely not appropriate for children. So if a child tuned into HBO thinking he was going to watch, you know, an early episode of Sesame Street, he might actually be exposed to one of those explicit movies or shows. So the same thing with Netflix. Netflix is making a name for itself with some decent or to sometimes great original movies, as well as TV shows like Orange is the New Black and others. In fact, I, I in House of Cards, their first show, which is on the demise right now, thanks to Kevin Spacey's departure. But I've always wondered why they even bothered with Christmas-themed romantic comedies. It just seems like Lifetime and Hallmark have that market cornered. They might as well just keep it cornered. Why would somebody want to invade it? But either way, it's a Netflix film. <laughs> Netflix tweeted about how weird it is that certain customers, 53 to be exact, have watched that over and over again in the days leading up to Christmas. So I figured I'd give it a shot and see if there's something about this film that my preconceptions about romantic comedies in general, particularly the Lifetime-like movies, maybe it's just hiding something I don't know. But anyway, here's the premise of A Christmas Prince, in case you need a premise. Here it is. When a reporter goes undercover as a tutor to get the inside scoop on a playboy prince, she gets tangled up in some royal intrigue and ends up finding love. But will she be able to keep up her lie? That's a question that the premise poses. And my answer to that is, what do you think? 
just about any movie that's a romantic comedy or not has has somebody you know coming up with a lie that they told they they tell and near the end of the second act it's always revealed that they're lying and then there's this falling out with borrowed music from full house or even netflix original fuller house which i'm not plugging i'm just saying that that is a show on netflix it might be a guilty pleasure of mine it might not be moving on so anyway the reporter who poses as a tutor in this movie is named Amber, and she's played by a delightful young actress by the name of Rose MacGyver. And Rose MacGyver plays an American in this movie with an impeccable American accent, but she's actually from Auckland, New Zealand. I mean, good job covering up her uh, New Zealand ac- um, accent. But anyway, she is at first an underappreciated copy editor at a magazine, but then her editor-in-chief sends her to a fictional country, and the name of the fictional country I don't know, but it's basically a low-rent England, just like it was in both Princess Diaries movies. You know, it's a Genovia-like country, if you're familiar with the Princess Diaries. So she's sent out to track the whereabouts and the ambitions of Prince Richard, who's played in this movie by an actual British person, Ben Lamb. And Prince Richard has a reputation for being a playboy, and it's mainly tabloid fodder, but as I'm watching this film and thinking to myself, he's not so bad, especially after the controversy with Prince Harry and the time he went to a Halloween party dressed up as a Nazi. Of course, Prince Harry has since improved, uh, you know, exponentially, but Again, he does have that sordid past, but compared to Prince Harry, this Prince Richard in this movie has nothing. So Prince Richard's father, the king, died, and he still has a living mother, Queen Helena, who's played by Alice Krieg, who's kind of a low-rent Julie Andrews, but she does well here. And Amber is sent there initially as a reporter, but when Prince Richard denies the press a press conference to see whether or not he really is king, Amber sneaks into the palace and finds herself an expected American tutor for Princess Emily, who is, of course, Prince Richard's sister. And she's playing this movie in a relatively nice performance by Honor Nifse. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. So... The movie kind of goes as you might expect. You find that Princess Emily is a little bit rebellious and she sent her other tutors packing for controversial reasons. And eventually she warms up to Amber and then eventually Prince Richard warms up to Amber and so on and so forth. And then there's an old flame of Prince Richard who comes to the the palace to, to stay and rekindle their relationship in vain or try to rekindle in vain. And then there's a competitor to the throne, blah, blah, blah. This movie is very predictable. It might as well have been a lifetime movie. I can't say I hated it. There were parts in the movie where I laughed. In fact, I probably laughed at more parts in this movie, not just the whole movie, than I did maybe the Emoji movie or even the movie I just reviewed, Just Getting Started. But It's a strikeout because Netflix can do so much better than this film. It's one thing if they re-aired it from a Hallmark or Lifetime broadcast, but to make this or to distribute this film themselves, it's not necessary, but it's not an inherently bad film either. I felt that the school was not for me, but last year I went to Mexico and I saw many things that made me change my mentality. At 24 years old, Jocelyn obtained her high school diploma. Jocelyn obtained her high school diploma. Mi maestra fue lo máximo para mí porque me ayudó mucho con todo. Nadie obtiene un diploma solo. Si estás pensando en obtener tu high school diploma, puedes recibir ayuda. Encuentra clases gratis de educación para adultos cerca de ti en completatudiploma.org. Patrocinado por el Dollar General Literacy Foundation y el Ad Council. They may say the things that we do, but they don't say it the way we do. It's all about free speech, baby. BostonFreeRadio.com. I love those real six sides They're the ones that move me A thinly blown Neurotic tone Intensify 
and groove me. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. So one of the films that's coming out this weekend, the big one that's probably going to knock Coco out of the number one slot of the box office, is Star Wars The Last Jedi, also known as Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Well, who has two thumbs that you can't see on the radio and reviewed the movie? This guy. Yeah, I just caught a sneak preview of it, thanks to another DJ on this radio station who has connections. Joe Vig was able to get me into a free screening of this movie, and I got to review it for you for this show. But here's a disclaimer. If you are worried about spoilers, I promise you I will not spoil anything. I'll just tell you what I think of the movie, I'll give you a premise, I'll tell you who's in the movie, who's not in the movie, but I won't spoil anything from this movie, and I also won't spoil anything from Star Wars The Force Awakens. So, with that said, here's the premise of Star Wars The Last Jedi. Having taken her first steps into the Jedi world, Rey, who's the character played by Daisy Ridley, joins Luke Skywalker... Mark Hamill reprising his role from the first three films, as well as a cameo at the very end of Star Wars The Force Awakens, on an adventure with Leia, played by the late Carrie Fisher, Finn, who's played by... mm, who's played by John Boyega, and Poe, who's played by Oscar Isaac, that unlocks mysteries of the Force and secrets of the past. So, there is a lot going on in Star Wars The Last Jedi, but like a lot of great films, just because there's a lot going on does not mean there's not a focused plot. So, you see Luke Skywalker in the reluctant role of this movie as not only Jedi Master, but also Jedi Trainer. And he he's in the role uh, that Yoda was in, in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Episode 5. And he is training Daisy Ridley on the Force and what the Force entails. So, in the meantime, you also have, on the dark side of the Force, Kylo Ren making a reappearance, who's reprised in this movie by Adam Driver. And this time, not only does Kylo Ren not wear the infamous mask that resembled... Darth Vader to a point, his grandfather, but he basically abandons this the mask and in a massive strength in this movie over Star Wars The Force Awakens, you find out what drove Kylo Ren to the dark side because that was one of my chief complaints about Star Wars The Force Awakens. And when I reviewed that movie two years ago, I did give it my rating of a knockout because I thought it was not as good as the first three Star Wars films, episodes four through six, but worlds better from than episodes one through three. But my main grievance is that Adam Driver played Kylo Ren, but you don't know why the son of Han Solo and Princess Leia turn bad. But this movie explains at least part of it. And it leaves enough of a mystery to go into episode nine. So maybe I spoiled a little bit of this movie, but not too much. Trust me. So anyway, Kylo Ren's voyage to the dark side. And by the way, Kylo Ren's real name, uh, real character name is Ben Skywalker, probably named after Ben Kenobi, which was the alias of Obi-Wan Kenobi in the very first Star Wars film, Episode Four: A New Hope. So you find out that Kylo Ren's voyage to the dark side began partly because of his parents, but also because of Luke Skywalker. How? I won't tell you. You have to see the movie to find out. But I loved the scenes between Daisy Ridley and... Mark Hamill. I thought they had amazing chemistry together because Mark Hamill is the reluctant teacher of of the Force, and Daisy Ridley has some things figured out, but not everything. And I thought they had a really good dynamic going on. I also 
while I thought that beginning of the film with a giant battle might not have been the best way to go, I did think the battle was still intriguing, particularly involving <laughs> Princess Leia, again, Carrie Fisher in the in the c- command deck, and Poe actually in a starfighter fighting off Kylo Ren, General Hux, the latter of whom is played by Domhnall Gleeson, as well as the rest of the evil empire. So, again, they're all the favorites from the previous movie, Star Wars The Force Awakens, as well as the first three Star Wars films come back here, and it's great to see them again. It's also great to see the characters of Poe, Rey, and and Finn become more developed as the movie progresses. There are also some very interesting new characters, such as Vice Admiral Amal and Holdo, who's played by Laura Dern, as well as a con artist by the name of DJ, who's played by Benicio Del Toro. And there are also some cute CGI characters, but unlike The Empire Strikes Back, the cute characters don't overtake the movie like the Ewoks are criticized as doing for the Return of the Jedi. I thought there was a very good balance of the stuff that will appeal to little kids as well as the the things that will satisfy Star Wars fans. And I have to say, I was so mesmerized and so impressed by this movie. The movie clocks in at two hours and 32 minutes, but it goes by incredibly fast. This movie, I think, is probably third only to Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, and Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back as the best Star Wars film that's come out yet. And it goes without saying that it earns my rating of a knockout. And I'm so happy that I got through this film without spoiling a single thing. I gave you the premise. I gave you the characters. That's all you need to know. I highly urge you to go see this movie. It is fantastic. It's better than Star Wars The Force Awakens. It's better than Return of the Jedi. It goes without saying that it's better than the three prequels that will not be mentioned. And this movie shows that the Star Wars film is not out of gas and it's charging It's important to buckle up your kids. I know. Sometimes car seats can be complicated. I know. And if your child's in the wrong seat and you get into a crash. I know. It could lead to a serious injury. I know. So you're 100% sure you have the right car seat for your child's age and size? I don't know. Don't think you know. No, you know. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Make sure you have the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. My name is Miss Nelson. My name is Bruce. And we've made a wild and wonderful record for you. We will tell you all kinds of things to do and be, and you can let your imagination go with us. Just listen to what we say, dear hearts. This is where the magic starts. Radioscopia, Fridays, 5 to 7 p.m., only on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the four movies I'm going to review for this show, I'm now getting into my next segment, which is what's coming out next. And this is a segment that is actually not going to last very long because there is literally only three movies that are coming out in wide, well, nationwide. And one of the movies is the movie I just reviewed, Star Wars The Last Jedi. So I'll just give you a synopsis in case you missed my last review. Having taken her first steps into the Jedi world, Rey joins Luke Skywalker on an adventure with Leia, Finn, and Poe that unlocks the mysteries of the Force and secrets of the past. So I've already raved about this film. It's probably one of my favorite films of this year. And that I don't, I can't say for sure whether or not it's going to be in the top 10, but trust me, it lives up to its hype, including the hype I'm giving it right now. So by all means, see this movie. I've already reviewed it for you, so I can't review it for you next week, but I urge you to see the film. The, the next movie that's coming out in theaters is Ferdinand, which is also coming out like Ambulance. 
Uh, I don't have a soundproof studio, but this is the best I can do. So anyway, the other movie that's coming out on December 15th, like The Last Jedi, is Ferdinand. And this is based on a children's book, and it's about a bull with a big heart named Ferdinand. And after Ferdinand is mistaken for a dangerous beast, he is captured and torn from his home. Determined to return to his family, he rallies a misfit team on the ultimate adventure. So, Ferdinand is an animated movie, and it is released by not Disney Pixar, not DreamWorks, but by Blue Sky Studios. And it's a movie that takes a a beloved children's book and makes it into a somewhat sardonic movie. But the voice cast includes actually... Um, as Ferdinand, John Cena, yeah, the, the WWE star, is the voice of Ferdinand in this movie, which is an interesting choice, um, particularly because John Cena has starred in his own movies, but not many that were related to or not related to WWE. In fact, even the supporting roles he's taken in movies like Sisters and Daddy's Home 2 don't involve somewhat of that masculine persona, but it has a little bit of a connection to his WWE character. But it's but Ferdinand is probably the first film where he's completely separated from his WWE persona, and good for him for stretching out his acting chops. He's probably going to be as big an actor. Probably not bigger than Dwayne Johnson, but of course we'll have to see. So the other actors who provide voices in this movie are SNL star Kate McKinnon, Bobby Cannavale, and Jack Gore. And Jack Gore actually just recently co-starred in Woody Allen's movie Wonder Wheel, which was an okay movie, probably a little bit less than okay, but he is an up-and-coming actor as well, and Ferdinand is a movie that I will see for next week's show, and when I see it, I will let you know exactly what I think. The other movie, the last movie that's going to be coming out in theaters near you, probably, is a movie called Permanent, and Permanent is a comedy about bad hair adolescents, and socially awkward family members. It involves life-altering permanence and poorly made toupees. Obstacles to daily survival ensue. So that is a weird plot synopsis, but the movie stars Patricia Arquette, Academy Award winner Patricia Arquette, I might add, and Rain Wilson. And permanent, I, I guess... Rain Wilson is the star of the movie, but because Patricia Arquette is a bigger name, they put her name first. Um, this is a movie that definitely looks odd. Again, it's saying it's coming out in theaters nationwide. I don't think it's going to hold a candle to either Star Wars The Last Jedi or the movies that are out that are breaking box office records right now, like Coco or Justice League. But it could do moderately well for people who don't want to see those Big budget movies. So permanent, I can't guarantee whether or not I will see this film, but I will seek it out and I will let you know what I think about it when I see it. So now that I've reviewed all the films that are probably or given you a synopsis of the films that are coming out next weekend, I might as well probably give you a synopsis on films that are coming out in theaters nationwide but haven't yet. And one of them is Darkest Hour, which I have briefly described on previous episodes of Words on Film, but I might as well just give them to you right now. So the film Darkest Hour is a film that stars Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill, and that is an interesting casting choice, a very interesting casting choice, considering that I would have expected a heftier actor like Stephen Fry or... Toby Jones to play Churchill, but either way, Gary Oldman has transformed himself into Winston Churchill's during the early days of World War II. So this is circa 1939 to 1941. And during this time, the fate of Western Europe hangs on the newly appointed British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who must decide whether to negotiate with Hitler or fight on against incredible odds. Now, for those of you who have... (laughs) who know your history, you know exactly what Winston Churchill does. 
However, that's not going to stop me from seeing the movie. And this is a movie I know I will see for next week's show. So when I see it, I will let you know exactly what I think. Another movie that's in limited release right now, but will soon be opening nationwide just in time for for the Oscar season and for Christmas is one called The Shape of Water. And Shape of, The Shape of Water is a movie that's directed by Guillermo del Toro, and it's a movie that takes place in the 1960s in a research facility where a mute janitor, who's played by Sally Hawkins, forms a relationship with an aquatic creature. I have not seen any previews for this movie. I don't usually watch previews, but this movie has been described by others as a modern adaptation of the creature of the, of the black lagoon. I don't know if that's true or not because I haven't seen it, but it certainly adds to the intrigue that I have going into this film. So the shape of water like Ferdinand and like darkest hour is a movie I will see for you and I'll review it for next week's show. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Hi, this is Josh Groban. My favorite thing about music is its ability to inspire and nourish the soul. That's why I'm proud to work with Feeding America, an organization that inspires hope for families in need and helps nourish the 16 million kids in this country struggling with hunger. The Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and helps get it to kids in need, but they can't do it alone. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. So I've reviewed a vast majority of, well, I've reviewed all the films I have have to review for this show. I've also gone through what's coming out next, which is the films that are coming out this coming weekend. I might as well get into the films that are coming out next weekend, the weekend of December 22nd through 24th. In other words, Christmas weekend. So... I am probably going to review five movies for next week's show, or at least I'm going to definitely give it my best shot. But next week's show is actually the last show that I'm doing for 2017. So you got me for this week, and now you're going to get me for next week. If I don't review five movies, I'm going to get into probably my favorite holiday movies. And that should be a fun segment. But... I'm really looking forward not only to my week off. I mean, I don't look forward exactly to time off. I don't ache for it because doing this show is a lot of fun. But that being said, not only is it nice to have a break, but Christmas break also gives me a time to catch up on films that are definitely Oscar-worthy, and also it gives me actually a backlog of films to review for my coming shows. So in the first couple of weeks of January and going into February, I'm able to actually stockpile films that I'm able to prioritize for this coming show. So I'm looking forward to that, but onward with what's coming out next. So there are a number of films that are coming out in theaters the Christmas weekend, actually more so than, than this coming weekend. And one of them is Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. And this is about four teenagers who discover an old video game console and are literally drawn into the game's jungle setting, becoming the adult avatars they chose. The movie stars Dwayne Johnson, Karen Gillan, Kevin Hart, and Jack Black. I'm not sure why Karen Gillan was second build there, because obviously Kevin Hart and Jack Black are better known names than her. But either way, Jumanji, I don't think, is a, a sequel to uh, the Jumanji film from 1995 starring Robin Williams and Bonnie Hunt. But I think it's more like a spinoff of that Jun Jumanji tale. But Jumanji is a film I saw once around the time it came out. 
I thought it was okay, but there are millennials who literally grew up watching that movie and probably have more of an affinity for Jumanji than I do. Again, Jumanji is a film that I didn't hate, but it's a film that I didn't especially love either. I've, I've seen better Robin Williams, is, is pretty much all I can say. But Jumanji is unfortunately, unless I see a preview of it before next week's show, it's not. It's probably not going to be a film that I'm going to review for next week's show. But in sometime in January, I'm probably going to review it, and I'll let you know exactly what I think. Another movie that's coming out in theaters on December 22nd, not December 15th, is Pitch Perfect 3. Even though the girls in the movie have graduated college, I guess they're still making these Pitch Perfect movies, but why not? The first two movies were pretty good. I actually thought the sequel was better than the original. But Pitch Perfect 3, who knows whether it's going to keep that trend up or not. But following their win at the World Championship in Part 2, the now-separated Bellas reunite for one last singing competition at an overseas USO tour, but face a group who use both instruments and voices. That sounds like a pretty stretched-thin premise, especially given where Pitch Perfect 1 and 2 began, but either way, the whole cast of Pitch Perfect's 1 and 2 are coming back for this movie. So Anna Kendrick, who I like very much, is coming back. And that's certainly a lot of credibility because without Anna Kendrick, I don't think Pitch Perfect 3 would be able to survive, but I could be wrong about that. Also, Brittany Snow, Haley Steinfeld, Rebel Wilson, and many of the other Bellas are coming back for this movie. And again, this is a movie I probably won't review for next week's show, but I'll be sure to review it sometime in January when I come back. And another movie that's coming out in theaters is an interesting one starring Matt Damon and Kristen Wiig, and it's called Downsizing. It's a comedy drama sci-fi film. And this movie better be good than suburb better be good and better be better than suburbia but i have the feeling that it will be again don't quote me on that but it is an r-rated comedy about a a guy who realizes he would have a better life if he were to shrink himself it's directed by alexander payne and also co-stars christoph waltz i'm not sure exactly how this movie is going to be but it sounds interesting and with that said that's all the time i have for words on film for this week i'm your host and movie critic your uh, Dan Burke, getting my radio shows mixed up. But thank you so much for tuning in. I've got one last show for 2017. I'm really excited for it. I'm excited for Christmas. I hope you guys are too. And we're going to have a great show before 2017 gets out. So until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. <laughs>